Good morning, friends, and welcome home to Modern Worship at Grace Avenue. My name is Joe Stobaugh, and I serve as the pastor of the Modern Worship Faith Community, and it's a joy to be in worship with you this morning. Friends, in order for you to participate as fully as possible in worship, I invite you to have a candle nearby so that we, we have the opportunity to light the candle a little later in the service. Together, we can sacralize the space in which we are worshiping. If you're new here, I want to encourage you to send me an email at joe at graceavenue.org so I can welcome you and share with you a little bit about our community. We're really glad you're here today. And if this is your spiritual home, I want to encourage you to click on the link in the comments section and register your attendance. That would be a great gift to us. Friends, next week is Mother's Day and we're going to celebrate our moms by putting together a video. So I want to encourage you to email a picture of your mother to Preston at graceavenue.org, either in honor of your mom or in memory of your mother. And we'll put that together and share a video before and after the service next week. It'll be a great, great way to honor the mothers in our lives. Friends, I want to give you a quick opportunity to hear from our Minister of Missions, Mary Martin, who's going to speak to us today about the different ways we can be involved and what God is asking us to do in the midst of this pandemic. Hi, I'm Mary Martin, and I serve as a missions minister here at Grace Avenue. Our mission statement is to eradicate homelessness in whatever form it presents itself. As our businesses and schools continue to stay closed during 
the midst of this crisis, many of our families in our community are food insecure. Plus, many of our food pantries are overwhelmed, seeing two to three times as many new clients daily. That's why Grace Avenue is committed to helping families to become food secure again. Grace Avenue has two food drives. Our Grace on the Go trailer food drive, which is located in the Circle Drive, needs general food donations of all kinds, which benefits our food pantry partners, the Little Elm and Frisco Family Services food pantries. Our grocery list food drive, located in the front office area of our church, is a two-week list of specific grocery items that are being delivered to food insecure families in our community through our local partnerships. You may drop off all food donations Monday through Sunday, 10 to four. To learn more about our food drives and to become more joyfully connected to our community, please go to graceavenue.org. Friends, we believe that God is present with us wherever we are. And as a way to symbolize Jesus' presence with us in worship this morning, I'd invite you to light the candle in your home with me. We give thanks for God's presence with us wherever we go. As a community of faith, we have a value statement that helps us to guide us in our ministry together and with one another. And so we're going to read that together. You'll see the picture of the words in the lower thirds of your screen, and I invite you to read it along with me. Here in modern Grace Avenue, we gather as a unified community from all walks of life. Without exception, we belong. We affirm and embrace people from every race, ethnicity, age, economic status, marital status, gender or sexual identity, ability or faith background, because all people reflect the face of God. Without exception, we belong. We seek to embody God's grace and justice in our community and in our world, and we recognize that historically, the church hasn't always done that. Part of our work together is to help right some of those wrongs. Without exception, we belong. In this space, we bring our full selves. We engage our minds. We struggle with our doubts. We cultivate sustainability. And we carry one another's burdens. Without exception, we belong. Together, as a unified people, let's raise our voices in song this morning. One, two, three, four.
My feet are strong My eyes are clear I cannot see the way from here But on we go God knows the way And in God's arms she keeps me safe
Good morning, everyone. My name is Christopher Vaughn. I'm the youth minister here at Grace Avenue, and I'll be reading our scripture today from the NRSV version of the Bible. It comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me into right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It always happens to me about the same time every single day. I suspect it happens like this for you too. You know what I'm talking about? That framework within your daily schedule that for whatever reason, it's nearly impossible to put the car in drive. Do you know what I mean? It's that time frame in your schedule where there's a few span of the hours where for whatever reason, you can't motivate to do even the things that you love to do. Nonetheless, the things you know that you have to do. And for me, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know why that time of the day is so hard for me, but it really is. Maybe it's a blood flow issue uh, from post-lunch. Maybe it's a circadian rhythm thing. Maybe it's the fact that turns out I'm not a machine after all. I'm only human and I can't crush things out 24 hours a day. Whatever the cause of this two o'clock affliction is, I know it is a real thing in my life. When I have the chance to speak at conferences, I'm always praying that I don't get the two o'clock slot. When I'm scheduling meetings, I try really hard not to schedule them between two and three because I know I won't be at my best. Whatever it is, two o'clock is the hardest time of the day for me. I wish I could remember who said this, but I heard once the story of a person asking a United Methodist bishop what hell would be like if it even existed. And the bishop was uh, very clear. He said, that's easy. Hell is eternally two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I don't know about you friends, but that's true for me. I suspect that we all struggle to create forward momentum in certain parts in our life. And that's a normal, natural phenomenon. But that feeling of not wanting to do anything, a feeling of kind of like you just don't care anymore, or maybe you even begin to feel resentful to the people that you're closest to, sometimes in life that can stretch out to a longer time frame, maybe even to an entire season. And when this happens to us, it can get pretty rough. There's actually a name for this kind of prolonged two o'clock in the afternoon feeling, and it's called acedia. And acedia can be described as a situation where one doesn't feel like they're able to even care about themselves or their place in the world anymore, or even the things that they love and are passionate about. Acedia can cause us to become bitter and resentful and look for ways to get out of whatever situation we are in because we've grown to loathe it. It's actually properly conceived spiritually as a temptation to be resisted. The concept of acedia has been around since the time of the ancient Greeks, but for us as followers of Christ, it really came to the fore in the 4th and 5th centuries and the time of the desert mothers and fathers. These were people who had seen the church become institutionalized and become wealthy, and they wanted to escape that and live the gospel as purely as they could. And so they went out to the desert, and they lived lives of isolation, and acedia was a common affliction for these monks because of their isolation. It was so prevalent that it was often called the noontime demon. And for the monastics in this period, acedia was considered one of the eight bad thoughts. I kind of like this idea of bad thoughts because the church, in my opinion, kind of messed this up several centuries later when they took the eight bad thoughts and turned them into the seven deadly sins. Now, I don't know about you, but I find bad thoughts to be a little bit more useful than deadly sins because once that nomenclature changed, deadly sins got tied to particular activities. And that led, and I think still leads, to moments of either self-righteousness or moments of self-loathing. Whereas bad thoughts are something that we all struggle with and things that we can work to do better with in our lives. 
This bad thought, this metaphorical demon of acedia is tricky. It would often attack a monk like this. They would wake up in the morning full of energy and hope and enthusiasm for the day. And as they continued along their schedule, as the morning began to fade into the afternoon, the routines of the day settled over the monk. Their hope would sometimes begin to ebb away as they look towards the afternoon. And the idea of enduring the afternoon seemed so daunting, so hopeless, that the monk began to resent even the things that they loved and would often, if Asidia had a hold of them, look for some other way out. Maybe there was a better monastery. Maybe there were better monks. Maybe there was a better teacher who could fix this. They became listless and had great difficulty engaging in their work both their physical work and their spiritual work. They couldn't find the focus to finish their tasks, and the things that brought them joy suddenly didn't now. Does that sound familiar to you in these days of quarantine? You know, for those of us who aren't in the front lines, I, I don't know about you, but the days for me sometimes run together. I need to remind, I count it to remind me if it's a Tuesday or a Saturday. I'm preaching this sermon on a Friday right now. And even the things that you used to look forward to, things like reading books and watching movies or working in the garden or being at home or whatever the thing that used to bring you joy now can seem kind of a burden to you. Maybe you're even a little bored or even slightly bitter. Sometimes acedia can even cause you to hate or silently loathe the very things that are helping to give shape to your life. And that can lead to us wanting to run away from the task and the life routines that are before us, even if we're only running to the fridge or maybe to takeaway service at our favorite restaurant again, or maybe to the liquor cabinet, or something to help numb the listlessness that we feel. I wonder if that's just as much at the heart of the rush to reopen our state as, as are the valid economic reasons. The real challenge for us of Acedia is that at the end of the day, Acedia is its most insidious because it's an, inver an aversion to being in this moment, to being in the now, and then that's coupled with a feeling that the future can feel overwhelming. That's a tough place to be. Acedia can be for, become for us a dark valley. I also need to say that the experience of acedia is a different thing altogether than depression. Depression is an illness that can respond to medical intervention. Acedia, however, is spiritually regarded as a temptation that can be resisted. We don't talk about temptation a lot, but I think in this particular case it's useful. So what are we to do with this experience of acedia? It's something that we all go through at some point in our lives because it is a part of our human condition. But the good news with anything that's a part of our human condition is that we are naturally not the first people to walk through the dark shadows of the valley that is Acedia. And in these moments, I turn to the Psalms. They are for me one of God's greatest gifts to us. They can help us center ourselves now in the joy and the gift and sometimes even the heartache of each breath. I don't think it's a coincidence that the same monks who struggled with acedia, that eternal feeling of two o'clock in the afternoon, are the same ones that in their liturgy developed a time for reading a psalm every morning and every night. And I want to encourage you in this season to pick that practice up. You can read one in the morning and one in the evening. Maybe you could even start with the most famous psalm of them all, the one we heard Christopher read just a moment ago. The psalm that is perhaps the most famous piece of scripture in the entire Bible, and that's Psalm 23. Friends, for thousands of years, people have turned to Psalm 23 for comfort and for the important reminder that God is faithful to us, especially in the most challenging times of our life. So this morning, I hope we can take a moment to really center ourselves into the psalm because there is a word from God for us in Psalm 23 today. Walter Brueggemann has said that Psalm 23 is a reminder that it is God's companionship that transforms every situation, even when we find ourselves struggling with acedia. You see, Psalm 23 was written under stress, under a difficult time. And in these moments, we need to hear the message that Psalm 23 is speaking to us because it reminds us of who God is, of what God does, and who we are. 
These are timeless words of hope that are grounded in the steadfast faithfulness of God. So I want to invite you now to close your eyes, connect with your breath, and listen with fresh ears to Psalm 23, this time from the message translation. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I am not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. And I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. That all of God's people say, Amen. Can you imagine with me what kind of situation must have prompted this writing? It couldn't have been a good scene, that's for sure. Whatever the author was going through must have been intense and scary. And clearly the situation the author was facing was out of their control or their ability to solve on their own. And I think there's something deeply important for us to feel in that. And that is this. In Psalm 23, God is the primary actor and not us. It's God who is at work, leading us, making us rest, leading us towards that which restores. And then God is the one doing that restorative work. God is the one who leads us onto the right paths. That's such an important spiritual principle for us to lean into in these times, is that God is doing the shepherding work. You know, in our culture, it's very tempting to want to shepherd ourselves, to be a people who make our own identity, who pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And that's good as far as it goes, but if we live long enough, we eventually have a moment or two in our lives where the illusion of total control, of destiny-making, is stripped away from us. And in that moment, we realize that we have some sheep-like tendencies. And then we have a choice to make. Will we continue to rely solely upon ourselves? Or will we begin to spiritually reconstruct our lives around the faithfulness and the goodness and the beauty and love of God? And if we make that choice, it's a lifelong spiritual task. Trusting in God's steadfastness can be really hard, especially when we're in the midst of walking through a dark valley of any kind. And those valleys come in many different ways. Our valley right now can seem pretty dark. We want to reopen, but we're worried about our neighbor and not putting people unnecessarily at risk. Maybe we are worried about our future or a job that we've lost or the effects of the economy uh, of the pandemic on our economy. Perhaps we're worried about aging parents or our children. It's a struggle to find hope in the midst of this valley. Like the person who wrote this psalm, we too are facing many different stressors, and yet the psalmist says that God is with us, that God restores our soul even in the midst of the real difficulties of the world. In these moments, God is not only with us, but God is looking out for us. I love the last line of the psalm, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. You see, it's this dwelling in the house of God is a present tense thing. It's happening right now. Or as Peterson so beautifully translates it, your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of my God for the rest of my life. I don't know about you, but when I look back on my life, it's not the enemies that I often see pursuing me, but rather I see the ways that God has been pursuing me with goodness and mercy. In the midst of a struggle, I often have a very hard time seeing where God is at work in the moment. I, I miss what God's doing. It's often only in hindsight where I can see the loving pursuit of God's goodness and mercy in my life. And yet, with enough distance and what I sort of call a little retroactive revelation, we can see the ways that God has been with us in these most difficult moments, the ways that God has protected us from harm. And it's in those moments when we look back that our faith is actually revealed to us. 
We see that God has been shepherding us all along, and God will continue to do so. It is in those eternal two-in-the-afternoon moments in life where I'm tempted by the metaphorical demon of Assyria and the present seems totally unsustainable and the future feels overwhelming, that I need to be reminded that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's why centering into this psalm is important because we need to be reminded and to tell each other that God is always pursuing us, especially in these moments where God feels far away. It may just be that God's right behind you or perhaps even ahead of you, nudging you towards a future that is aligned with the goodness of God's dreams for the world. Sometimes in life we, we do have to struggle with and wrestle with the stages of acedia or whatever dark valley we find ourselves in. There's no easy answers. There's no three-step plan, no get-out-of-jail-free card. But what is there and what is real and what is true is that God offers to us grace and love and beauty, steadfast faithfulness, and God's presence. And when we have those things, God's given us everything we need to walk through the dark valleys and to experience life abundantly in the midst of them. To realize with a little bit of retroactive revelation that we've never walked through a dark valley alone and we never will. So in this season, when we're prone to attacks of acedia, where it sometimes feels like it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon all the time, when we're tempted to give up because we just can't find a way to care anymore, May we remember that Jesus himself is with us. He is our shepherd, guiding us on to better paths, walking with us through the vows, even preparing a dinner for us in the midst of our hardest seasons, with a table that is overflowing with everything we need. If you need patience and tolerance, God will put it on your table. If you need love and grace, God will do it. If you need calm and trust or peace, God will put that on your table in the midst of your enemies. Because that is who God is. And pursuing us and all the world and everyone in it with beauty and love, justice and grace, that's what God does. We just need to put ourselves in a place to receive it. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, let all of God's people say, Amen. And part of our work together is to be a people who are in prayer for the deep needs of the world. So we will practice the prayers of the people this morning. I'll lift up a category for you to be in prayer for, either out loud or in the silence of your heart. And I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this moment, for the way in which you are always pursuing us with goodness and beauty and love. God, we know that we have the opportunity to partner with you in the healing of the world. And we know that there's a lot that needs to be healed. So we begin with prayer, just as Jesus did, knowing that it leads us to action. This morning, God, we pray for everyone who is affected by the coronavirus, those who are ill, those who have died, and their friends and family, and those who are working to combat it. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayers. God, we pray for all those people who feel like they must return to work and don't have a place for their kids to be taken care of. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for all those who have been locked up together for low these many days and the patience and grace they need to continue to be kind to themselves or to each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And God, we pray for us, your church, that we may be a people who see the pursuit that you are engaged in with us and who love others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We thank you, God, for always being there for us, for being ready and eager even to hear our prayers, to comfort us, to send us peace. 
And God, we pray all these things up in the one who gives us a peace that passes all understanding, the words he taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Part of our work together, friends, is to be the people who partner with God in healing the world. We do that together through the ministries of this church. And the only way we do that is through your generosity. So I want to encourage you in this moment of offering that's coming up to give uh, deeply and graciously to the work that God is doing. You can do that either by setting up a recurring gift online, texting to give, dropping a check off at the church or in the mail, and we'll gratefully put that to use helping to heal the world. Friends, let us give deeply to God in our offering this morning.
Friends, what a joy it's been to be in worship with you this morning. I know that you join me in giving God thanks for the lives of the class of 2020 and these incredible seniors, so many of whom have worked hard to make our modern faith community a reality. We give God thanks for them, for the way in which God is working in their lives, and for the amazing things that God is going to do in their future. Know that we love you and we're proud of you and can't wait to see what God does in your life. Friends, I invite you to take the peace that passes all understanding with you out into the world. In the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, let all God's people say together, amen. Go in peace.